I will try to avoid for a minute. My name is Ashim Sarkis. I am the new dean of the School of Architecture and Planning at MIT, and I'm here to welcome you all to the case conference organized by the History Theory and Criticism Program in the School of Architecture at MIT. And I would like to thank the School of Architecture and the Center for Art, Science and Technology for sponsoring this event. 100 days and so to the job, I find myself in a strange position, having to welcome colleagues to MIT when just this morning I was still hearing the words, welcome to MIT. And yet, if anything can be learned from the venue that you had created in 1964, it is that the space of dialogue transcends the place of convening, and for that perhaps a welcome back to dialogue is a more fitting way to start the game. During this weekend, three generations of scholars and architects will be discussing the impact that case as a space of dialogue and debate has had on architectural education and its history over the past 50 years. Allow me please then to simply dedicate two minutes to talk about the future of dialogue among scholars and among institutions. In November 2014, at the conference in Colombia, many of you attended, and in our first get-together as new deans, Amal Abdraos and I quickly got down to talking about collaboration between Colombia and MIT, but across universities as well. In an increasingly level playing field, not just in the United States, but across the world, and in an increasingly connected and visited network of exchanges among architects and scholars, it is difficult to understand why a parallel sense of competitiveness and isolation is growing among schools of architecture. Perhaps it is this Freudian narcissism of small differences that is pulling us apart to desperately distinguish ourselves from each other. But as the case conferences have proven, it is the real differences that we should be seeking to articulate, and only through sustained dialogue and debate can they be found. It is the real differences that make us more hospitable and generous. Perhaps it is my personal friendship with Amal that prompts this, or is it the naive optimism of the new kids on the block? And perhaps you should be worried when it is two Lebanese who are calling for peace and dialogue in the world. <laughs> but we are moving ahead with this idea, so please stay tuned. The convening capacities and responsibilities of institutions can only be further enabled by individual initiatives, such as those taken by HTC faculty over the years. Across many generations, Stafford Anderson, Mark Jasenbeck, Arindan Dutta, and Anna Maria Leon, I stand here to thank you all for your tenacity in bringing us together again, again, and again. Now, as much as I am honored that it is at MIT that dialogue is being promoted as the means to enhance our shared architectural culture, I am also aware, as Shakespeare scholar Stephen Greenblatt has pointed out, that the notion of culture itself, including architectural culture, has been responsible for disguising, even hiding, the dialogues and exchanges that make culture happen under the false necessities of authenticity, spatial fixity, and status. The crucial first task for scholars, Greenblatt proposes, is simply to recognize and to track the movements that provoke both intense pleasure and intense anxiety. So please, let them, the pleasure and anxiety, begin. <laughs> Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Mark Arsenek. I teach the history theory and criticism section here um, in the School of Architecture. Before I begin, I would like to uh, mention two people who have a profound impact on our program here, uh, since they're both here uh, today, and it's a sort of unique opportunity to single them out. Uh, first, of course, is Stanford Anderson, who is sitting right, right here, who was one of the founders, uh, along with Hank Millen, and Wayne Anderson of the HCC section. Uh, that was uh, one of the first PhD programs in the School of Architecture in the United States, and 
uh, Professor Anderson, one of the first with a PhD to teach in a school of architecture, and in some sense transformed the very core uh, pedagogical orientation of our discipline, producing a program that has produced uh, uh, students teaching in, I think, uh, the, the largest, I think we're ranked as students who teach in their field, um, in their discipline, um, at, I think, 98%. So it's quite an accomplishment. Also we have here today is uh, Hank Millen, who's good to see him, and he's also saw him walking by somewhere. Uh, there he is. And uh, Hank and Stan uh, have their friendship and their collegiality, their perseverance. Um, there is unique in, I would say, in this sort of um, uh, generation and even in, in our generation and has uh, sort of had a sort of substantial impact uh, on many of us. Both of them are our father figures, our mentors, and our friends. So if I could have a, a round of applause, please, just for, for that. So it was uh, Stan's article in the book, second, My Second Modernism, MIT, Architecture and Techno-Social Moment, that was uh, organized by Arindam, that uh, sparked this uh, conversation. And Arindam sort of took, took it on to, in some sense, think about what it would be like if we sort of got everybody uh, back together. And so Arindam gets the credit for, in some sense, uh, envisioning uh, this event. And he and uh, other colleagues and Ana Maria sort of made it, made it happen. And I think this is going to be an event that will be uh, partially reunion, uh, partially, hopefully, uh, have a, uh, a discussion about sort of the pedagogical imperatives that um, I think we need to reevaluate in today's world, and uh, scholarly impact. So it has different, uh, uh, I think, levels uh, that will be important for us in various ways. But it's important to also note that many, uh, not many, but uh, there are many of us, for many of us here, that there are participants in case that are not here. So I'd just like to briefly mention them. There's Michael Graves, who passed away in March 12th. His life uh, contributions to architecture are, are well known and we will uh, remember them. Uh, then there's also, of course, Colin Rowe, whose uh, voice resonates in our ears uh, for those of us who know him and Oscar Newman, who I have not met or known, uh, but who seems to have a particularly wry humor uh, from the way, uh, from the photographs. Uh, I see he, he designed a sort of massive underground thing in New York that looks a little bit like um, the Matrix City. I don't know, that was. Uh, then there's sort of Bob Slutsky, the painter and teacher of, uh, of Love Legion. Uh, Giovanni Passanella, who established the firm PKSB, um, which is still going strong uh, 40 years later. So if you put the names uh, of these and the names of the entire case uh, grouped together, you have a remarkable uh, set of people who came together in the mid-60s, young, creative, energetic, uh, trying to rethink the architectural world and ultimately, in small and little ways, uh, change it. And I think uh, that there would be some discussion, I think in Stan's article, there was some question he raised, well, how impactful was case? And you know, I think that at first, some people said, well, maybe not enough and maybe too much. We can sort of address that. But I think it's quite clear that it's sort of dissemination um, sparked um, changes that took place sort of far afield. We might not sort of see a one-to-one -one relationship, but there's definitely a sort of a, a you know, one-to-one, one-to-two, one-to-five, somewhere out there in the world, sort of this sort of network of relationships that make this uh, important. And that's why revisiting case, I think, is a good thing for us to do. For it's not only a window into something that took place in the, in the 60s, but it's also a window perhaps even into what we have uh, today the sort of intelligent and open-ended conversations, um, sometimes look, uh, discussing things that today we sort of find a little hokey. Um, we go, hmm, why, why are we not talking about those things anymore? So there was a call for an architecture as a site of sort of uh, discursive and theoretical speculation that I think in our overstructured academic world 
uh, might sound quite refreshing. <clears throat> there is a call for an architecture as a site of a certain type of spatial imagination that I think in our overstructured academic world of today, I think will also sound refreshing. So I look forward to the conversation. Thank you very much. Hi, good morning. Thank you for joining us so much. Uh, my name is Ana Maria Leon. And I'm a PhD candidate at MIT's History, Theory, and Criticism of Architecture and Art program. Uh, and I'm here to give you uh, a big sort of broad view, uh, an introduction to CASE, uh, the Conference of Architects for the Study of the Environment. Our story begins in 1964. One year later, Le Corbusier swam to his death in the Mediterranean and the first US combat troops arrived in Vietnam. Two years later, two years later after the beginning of our story, two canonical books on the city were published at the same time. Robert Venturi's Complexity and Contradiction, uh, who he mentions in the first case meeting as a little book that he's having out soon, quite easy to write. And Aldovos is La Arquitectura de la Chita. Yet Rossi's book uh, would not be published in English until 1982, uh, thanks in no small part to the agency of Peter Eisenman and with a translation by Joan Ockman and Diane Girardo. And Peter and Joan are here with us today. I mentioned this curious temporality of Ossie in the United States um, to highlight that in many ways it's a very local story, an English-speaking story affected very directly by the events and the conversations happening in the United States at this time. One year later, before the beginning, well, sorry, one year before the beginning of our story, Martin Luther King Jr. spoke by the steps of the Lincoln Monument. John F. Kennedy was assassinated, and Penn Station was demolished. Our story begins the year Bernard Rudofsky wrote Arch of Architecture Without Architects, and the year Lyndon Johnson signed the Civil Rights Act, a piece of legislation developed, according to Malcolm X, in response to the fear generated by African-American riots. The case meetings are situated geographically close to these events, but far away in terms of race and income. And if you pay attention, you can hear a bit of the echoes of what's going on in the country in their conversations, just like the events happening in the US right now might inflect ours. I mention these events to highlight the time and the place in which case took place. This story is set in the United States, and in many ways it is a local story, as I said before, of a group of young architects in their early 30s, most of them, as many of the students that are here today. Starting their careers in a moment when the CM had ended, it's 1959, and Le Corbusier uh, is at the end of his career, and modern architecture has become, in a way, the language of authority, the very authority being called into question by the events of the late 60s. It is a moment with enough temporal distance from the start of the modern movement and geographical distance from Europe to prompt Peter Eisenman, what Peter Eisenman would propose as a reformulation, a search for new directions in architecture that respond to this distance from Europe as origin of the modern movement and to a different sociopolitical moment. So I'll now give you a summary of the case meetings from 1964 to 1974, so you can have a broad view of the events that we intend to discuss in this conference, with special emphasis on the first meeting. And I can do this thanks to the recent essay events by Stanford Anderson, which has already been mentioned. And if you haven't read it already, you can download it from our website or buy the book. Um, and to the generous access to his archives as Secretary of Case, to the participants of this conference. So another way to describe these 10 years we're about to examine is to say they covered the distance from this proper young fellow to this cool and collected gentleman. <laughs> <laughs> the 
So in order to introduce today's discussion, uh, I, as I said, I'm going to place special emphasis on the first two meetings, and thanks here go to Kenneth Frampton, who found the tapes of the first Princeton meeting in 1964, and generally made them available. The summer of 1964, several architecture academics met in Cranbrook for the AEAA ACSA conference shared by Lawrence Anderson, also head of MIT Architecture, to discuss the teaching of history in schools of architecture. The proceedings were published as, quote, the history, theory, and criticism of architecture, unquote. Three European speakers generated a lot of discussion. Bruno Zevi from Rome argued for historians who take over the direction of schools of architecture. And Rainer Banham from London argued the affliction of architecture was symbolism rather than utility. He was confronted by Stanford Anderson, recently hired at MIT, who challenged Banham's position as scientific determinism. Also in the conference, one woman, Sybil Mohoy Nash, Henry Millen, also from MIT, Colin Rowe from Cornell, and Peter Eisenman from Princeton. Following this meeting, Eisenman contacted some of the attendants and other young architects and teachers with the idea of forming, quote, a critical apparatus to discuss issues crucial to the development of a future architecture, unquote. With his Princeton colleagues Michael Grace and Tom, Tim Rieland, Eisenman convened a meeting that will later became known as Case One. Among the attendants, Colin Rowe, Hank Millen, and Sam Anderson, Richard Meyer, practicing in New York, Jack Robertson and Vincent Scully at Yale, Robert Venturi in Philadelphia, and recent London arrival Kenneth Frampton. So recent he had to fly by helicopter from J J JFK to Princeton to make the meetings. So. We need to always remember that joke. Eisenman started the meeting by marking the distance with the first generation of modern architects. In a sense, he said, one of these problems is what we have is that we have not had a modern architecture in this country as it was defined in Europe 30 years ago. Now, perhaps we have not had a modern architecture because we did not have the same problems that they had, or rather because we chose to ignore them. But I think today, these problems have become universal. If in the 1930s the problem was revolution, Eisenman now found the problem was one of reformulation. And he continued, all of us here are architects and teachers and as such, we have already taken on a responsibility. And all the bolts in these quotes are mine. I don't think we're politicians and I don't think that we're flag wavers. I don't believe in flag waving because I don't think that as architects this is our job. However, I think that if our architecture and our teaching is to have any meaning, then we must be willing to find some direction for this work. Therefore, we must concern us, ourselves this weekend with a beginning, with a reformulation of principles about a future architecture and what these principles of this group can do for this future. He was followed uh, with somewhat opposing views on architecture's relationship to the public from two English historians, Kenneth Frampton and Colin Rowe. Frampton paraphrased Aldo van Eyck in arguing for an architecture oriented to the masses. If architecture had formerly served princes and priests, it must now respond to new cultural realities by redefining itself into new roles. Roles, he concluded, that may be more modest. Rao countered this position, and it's sort of amazing in listening to the transcripts to hear Colin Rowe give an impromptu answer that reads like a small essay, uh, and every sort of paragraph has a topical idea. Just, you know, one can hope. <laughs> um, Roe countered this position by arguing that the public had long been used to justify different architectural discourses and warned that the very nature of modern architecture promoted certain fantasies, fantasies that it was someone's duty to reveal, one being the fantasy of the architecture as savior and messiah, and the other modern architectures with irreconcilable aspirations to order within continuous change. They were in turn both countered by a practitioner, by Robert Venturi, who argued for the architecture as a doer, whose speculation and talking must relate to making and doing, as opposed to an intellectual who is interested in ideas and direction. Alluding to the preceding speakers, uh, with the idea of ideas and direction, and close with a quote by T.S. Eliot on the interrelation between criticality and creativity to defend the idea that, of the architect as someone whose ideas and direction, pun intended, because these were uh, in Peter Eisenman's sort of letter calling them together, 
uh, are related to working and doing. Richard Meyer agreed and put forward the housing situation in Harlem as the kind of architectural problem they should address, and this is Meyer. This is the kind of problem in which we, as individuals concerned with the future of architecture, must be actively involved, in which we take the responsibility for making proposals that confront the unresolved dialectic of the urban condition. To build architecture has to do with the attitude with which we confront the existing power structure, which will influence the future of architecture. Michael McKinnell agreed as a fellow practitioner, and then Tim Reeland elegantly picked up on the, all the previous threats to argue for a re rethinking of architectural education to prepare architects not only for the problems of mass housing, but also for the pragmatic challenges of practice, viewed as both fantasy and reality. A recurring theme through the weekend, and I apologize for my crude characterization of everybody here, which will show up in different forms in other meetings was that, that of the architect's creativity and on ways to better understand the creative impulse. And finally, city planning was a contested issue. Jack Robertson, involved in New York City planning, spoke of the perception um, of architects as inessential in society and advocated an involvement in policymaking. Vincent Scully defended architecture against planning uh, to Hank Millen's opposition and lamented the devaluation of the past. The group decided to meet again, and then Therese said goodbye. I won't go into the full two days worth of sessions in 1964. We have incomplete information, and not all the speakers are identified in the recording. And besides, we hope to discuss some of these recurring topics in the group's meetings throughout the day. In listening to the transcripts, we can see there was a spectrum of critical positions as to the discipline and its role, some more complementary and flexible and others quite firm in their determination to keep their distance. A tension between practice and reflection and an interest in collaboration stood in various different ways, from the potentially fruitful discussion of ideas or projects to the more pragmatic mobilization of a group itself for, the promotion, for promotion in order to secure individual jobs. We sense the architects are aware of the advantages provided by the idea of a group particularly when allied uh, with a polemic idea or manifesto, to gather attention, but to what effect, and how to maintain the balance between their own disagreements and the common front needed for a group's identity. These discussions will reappear throughout the life of case. So I'll quickly take you through the following meetings. Case two was in 1965, and it was convened by Anderson, Eisenman, Frampton, Graves, and Millen to discuss the sign and criticism as interdependent activities. You see how they are picking up on some of the threats already. The group called itself Case and designated Anderson as executive secretary and Eisenman and Frampton as, quote, ad hoc committee on bylaws, unquote, and established a series of study groups. It's interesting to compare uh, in the 10 issues listed in the foundation statement to Anderson's notes on the committees and their members. So you can see uh, his notes above and then the clean sort of version below. The list reflects the diversity of interest in the group, but paradoxically, seems to be in reverse order to the importance of their main concerns. So if you go through it, uh, the last topic there below is education and architecture. That's the last of the list, but you see most people have signed up for that. Uh, and then we have history and criticism, which of course has all the historians. Uh, and then we have form, uh, sort of a more proactive mobilization of creativity. Uh, with a big group signed up. But then for creativity itself, it's a smaller group. It's the discussion between Millen and Anderson. And then psychology of the architect, including his guilt complexes and those like, unrevealing of the fantasies that only has rope. Um, <laughs> right? Here we have architecture and its political structure uh, with Robertson and Pasanella. And architecture and other disciplines has a very lonely mire there. Technological innovation has Graves and Anderson, and industrial techniques uh, has, I cannot read that. Who's there? Someone else. Um, Newman, okay. Oh, no one, oh, okay, sorry. Uh, so issues, and, and this was, uh, Mark sort of highlighted this in the last time we discussed this, how these issues that are sort of at the forefront of our, some discussions today, didn't have as much interest uh, back in the day. And then up first, we have the city and mass phenomena, including its ethnic and racial problems, 
uh, with Frampton uh, Meyer and Graves. So the magazine, oh, and the magazine group is also full, first here, journal. Um, although that project would be over by the end of the year. Case three and four took the form of symposiums at MIT. Case three was organized by Anderson and Millen, who had who called on distinguished academics and disciplines outside architecture, but the resulting discussions left case members feeling a little left out. Prospective members attended and were invited to join, including Robert Slutsky and Don Linden. Graves and Meyer organized case four as a conference titled uh, A Critical Approach to Urban Form. This is here. The event was successful, but indicative of the group's problems, the great diversity of interests and the introspective nature of the meetings. Linden proposed a solution to both problems. By having case members invade a school of architecture for a week, the group would focus on education as their common theme and project itself towards the larger architecture community. Am I? Yes. So in 1967, case members did just that by organizing a teaching in Oregon, Linden School. And we'll hear more about that in our second panel. But the event included several invited guests, among which I want to highlight Dora Wavenson of History of Art and Architecture in Oregon and Dolores Hayden. And here we have some of the schedules here. Case members also worked in school teams for the MoMA New City Exhibition, presenting projects for different sites of Harlem a site chosen by Arthur Drexler, director of the Department of Architecture and Design at MoMA, and Eisenman. And we'll hear more about the recurring theme of the city, city planning, and city politics in different iterations throughout case uh, in our first panel. Also, sorry, I passed myself here. Um, also in uh, 1967, MIT students demolished the studio walls, ideas. Um, and built mezzanines over a weekend. And in New York, Peter Eisenman created the Institute for Architecture and Urban Studies. And around this time, case members agreed to split into city groups. Two such case meetings were convened in 1969. One in Boston uh, by Anderson, who led a workshop to design and build an exhibition at MIT and organize a meeting for the exhibition in 1969. And these are images from that and one in New York, a meeting organized at MoMA and co-sponsored by, by the IAUS and New York case. Um, and we can see here some of the guests, which include Rosalind Krauss. Um, I find it interesting to see also that in the schedule, Anthony Eardley, who could not join us today, uh, is discussing the dilemma of type. And I particularly enjoyed the disclaimer here. I'll read it for you. Case, unfortunately, will only be able to provide intellectual simulation for this particular meeting. <laughs> Transportation, accommodations, and meals will be the responsibility of each person attending the sessions. I'm going to remember that for... Okay. <laughs> so in 1971, uh, Case 8 was organized by Case New York. The conference was organized around Rowan Slutsky's transparency essay with new guests, including George Baird, Rosalind Krauss and Anthony Vidler, and I really just wanted an excuse to use this picture of Anthony Vidler. <laughs> we can see how these events led to the Five Architects exhibition at MoMA. After that, the IUS uh, took over with the participation of some case members, and here's the team in the Casabella coverage of the group. Eisenman and Frampton edited the IUS journal Oppositions, while Anderson focused on a new project taking, taking shape at MIT the formation of the first PhD program in the history of architecture, eventually in the form of the History, Theory, and Criticism of Architecture and Art Group, or HTC. We're very happy to be your hosts today. In discussing the group, its members have agreed to disagree. Eisenman has described it as a rather ugly child, ill-formed and without direction. Anderson has said its diversity it might be both the reason for its demise and the source of inspiration towards new projects. Frampton has focused on the difficulty of finding an area of true agreement. I finish perhaps with the voice of Colin Rowe, who in the first meeting pointed out that often disunity and disagreement might be more productive than a willingness to get along. 
So what happened to case? Did it benefit from this productive disunity, as Roe put it? Was this energy the source of both its success and eventual dissolution? Would a publication, as oppositions did later, have helped balance the different interests of the group and broadcast them outside? Is a combined model of practice and academia group still viable today when they seem increasingly separate? Can practicing architects meet with professional historians when specialization seems to pull them increasingly apart? Perhaps our panelists and moderators will address some of these issues. For the purposes of today's event, we decided to organize the conversation along three main topics that provided inspiration, discussion, and action for the members of CASE. The city, introduced by Deepa Ramaswamy, activism and interdisciplinarity, introduced by Jessica Varner, and the tension between formal autonomy and a historical precedent, introduced by Rick Swustra. Deepa, Jessica, and Rick will give you brief introductions to the political, cultural, and architectural context that surrounded these discussions and to the main issues at stake. We will then ask our panelists and moderator to come to the stage for a conversation, and after each panel, we will finish with an opportunity for questions and answers from our audience. We will conclude with a keynote discussion on the links and divergences between CASE and IAUS, preceded by a short presentation by Joan Ottman. Before I cede the podium to Deepa for our first introduction, I want to take a moment to thank a few institutions and people that have been key in the organization of this event. Revisiting CASE is organized by the HTC program and funded by the MIT Center for Art, Science, and Technology and by the MIT Department of Architecture. Thanks go out to Arindam Dutta, Director of HTC, Mijin Yoon, Head of the Department, Leela Kenny, Executive Director at CAST, and to our Dean Hashim Sarkis for all their support. Very special thanks to Anne DeVoe and Kate Beerley, who provided the structure and support that keeps HTC running, Deepa Ramashwamy, Jessica Varner, and Rick Swutra, who will be introducing our panels today, Irina Cherniakova at MIT Publications for her fantastic support in printing and promotion, and for her collaboration assembling some relevant case materials upstairs at Keller Gallery. Please walk by as, you, um, as we break for lunch. We invite you to visit. Um, I also want to thank Kyle Barker, recent MIT graduate, for the wonderful post poster, and our team of HTC assistants and volunteers, Todd Satter, Nico Vicario, Albert Lopez, Christiana Bonin, Sarah Berger, Huma Gupta, Iver Massey, Carolyn Murphy, and Dar Daryl Cobb. Please join me in thanking all of these individuals and institutions for their generous support. Thank you.